completely different and an extremely welcome relief from something else that's going on uh, tomorrow. Um, our speaker tonight is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and he's taught astronomy to adults and children for over 30 years. He's written books and articles on astronomy and has a column in the BBC's Sky at Night magazine. <coughs> so will you please give an astronomical welcome <laughs> to <laughs> Sylvia <laughs> Tonkin. I must, just, I must just say so. I've uh, learned about a new, um, a new planet this evening. Well, actually, I knew about it already. But if you look at Steve's uh, T-shirt, he's got Russell's teapot, uh, which is going down the solar system, which, as you all know, is, is a genuine uh, astronomical body in the solar system. Thank you. <laughs> if you think it isn't, prove it. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me, um, and I'm so glad you made it. Because it wasn't a given. <laughs> because, you know, the universe, as far as we know, from a sample of one, has only found one way of creating life. But there are hundreds of ways it's got to destroy it. I mean, to put it briefly, the universe is an utter bastard. And we're going to prove it. So let's have a look at some of the ways it tries to get rid of. And I'm not even going to touch on things like the way we try to get rid of each other, you know, which is, um, I'm sure it's humans, we don't, but uh, that's one of those sadder things about our species. So, first thing we've got on here are gamma ray bursts. So what's a gamma ray burst? Well, it's usually something like supermassive black holes or more rare stars collapsing, forming a black hole, or two neutron stars combining, or something like that. It's really high energy stuff. And when these things come together, you probably remember from, from school, the Earth's spin axis is like this, but the magnetic axis isn't the same. And so, what happens when these things spin? Their magnetic field may not be along the spin axis, and what you can get is a blast of collimated energy in two different directions, gamma ray energy. So in a few seconds, these things release about enough energy as our sun will release in its entire lifetime. Now, let's try to put that into some sort of perspective. The Hiroshima bomb, which was equivalent to about 20,000 tonnes of high explosive, converted 0.6 grams of matter into energy. The sun converts hundreds of tonnes of matter into energy every second. So imagine how much, try to imagine, how much that's going to be in, say, about an 8 billion year life alone. That is enormous amount of energy, and it lasts in two directions. So, this is, these things might actually account for the Fermi Paradox, which is this idea of, uh, you may be familiar with the Drake Equation, the idea that there is a way, possibly, of getting some idea of how many intelligent civilizations there may be in our galaxy. And Drake's original idea came up with about 50,000. Well, if there's 50,000 existing now, why haven't we discovered any? And one possible reason is they aren't there, and because they would have been wiped out by gamma ray bursts. So, if one happened in our galaxy, it would destroy the ozone layer, Bombard the side of the Earth facing it with radiation, wiping out just about everything. So you have mass extinction, certainly on one side of the Earth, then food chain disruption and absolute blooming chaos. But you might remember what I said originally was that it's two collimated beams. It only is a problem if you're in the beam. And to put some sort of perspective on that, if we scale things down so that the sun scales down to the size of a basketball, the Earth is then a two millimetre pinhead about 27 metres away. It's a pretty small target. And we'll scale that down even further so the Earth's size of a ping pong ball, the average separation of stars in our galaxy is about from here to Edinburgh. So, you know, it's uh, quite a long way. 
and it's so we're a minuscule target. So how frequent are they? Well, we don't know. It's thought to, in our galaxy, about once every hundred thousand or million years. We can expect one can detect about one per day from the universe, and that's the long ones. Ones that last, uh, I think we've got one there? No, we haven't. Um, ones that last two seconds or longer at long gamma ray bursts. That's there. But nobody has a clue how many short ones there are. And the reason for that is that, I mean, astronomy is a really difficult subject to study. You're either dealing with things that last millions or billions of human lifetimes, or you're dealing with things that are, as near as makes no difference, instantaneous and gamma ray bursts on the latter end of the spectrum. So it's one of the serious speculations is that a gamma ray burst might have been responsible for wiping out the trilobites, the Ordovician Silurian extinction event just before the Cambrian explosion. But we don't know. So what can we do about it? Any suggestions? <laughs> There's going to be a certain theme coming through the talk tonight. There's nothing. Because these things travel at the speed of light and information cannot travel faster than the speed of light, we won't know about them until they hit us. What's the risk? Infinitesimally tiny. So why do I bother telling them? Because they're fun. How many <laughs> astrophysics get into it? It's remarkably good fun. <laughs> then we can step it up a bit. If like gamma ray burst is like taking a flip knife to a boxing match, magnetars are more like taking a cruise missile to a boxing match. Okay. What we've got is these slow rotating of the neutron stars is slow. A neutron star is something that have, might have a mass of the sun or a bit more and it's um, sort of condensed down so it's something about the size of four of them. So that's quite dense. Um, and they have very, very powerful magnetic fields and they emit gamma rays and x-rays as they decay. And what happens is they are sort of fairly quiescent and then for some reason or you get like a stellar equivalent of an earthquake going on. So you get this star quake going on and it disturbs a whole lot, and they blast out this bit. It's like a gamma ray burster, only it's omnidirectional. It's not only omnidirectional, you've got a massive electromagnetic pulse with the thing. And this makes it, it makes Captain Proton's destructor being pale into insignificance. Um, we think there's about 30 million of them in the Milky Way. How they get us? Well, they will bathe us in x-rays. And if that's not enough to kill us, well, it'll just lead to long-term radiation sickness. How nice. Also knock out, and this is the important one, knock out communication satellites. We depend a heck of a lot on what's going around up there now. And if you hit those with a large electromagnetic pulse, a lot of them are going to be knocked out. You knock out enough of the wrong ones, or the right ones, depending on which way you look at it, you could actually do things like take the internet out immediately. You take the internet out immediately, you take world trade out immediately, you do that, you have economic collapse. Immediately. <laughs> it's not, and if you've ever been anywhere that's gone through economic collapse, um, it's not a pretty sight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you will not make any comments about Friday night. <laughs> 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 <How true is this? laughs> Well, I was in Zimbabwe while Mugabe was doing his worst. Um, yeah, it was not a pretty sight. And as usual, you know, the people who really, in all these things, the people who really take the brunt of it are those who can't afford to. So, how frequent are they? They ought to be up there. They've been hit twice since we first got hit by one. This is. Uh, spacecraft near Schumacher. Schumacher, that went, was going to the asteroid Eros. This was part of the near Earth asteroid research, thing, which I'll go into a bit later. And its first insertion attempt in 1998 failed. Sorry, am I writing that way? 
Yeah, no, it's too short. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's possible to move that track into some so back about three or four feet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 Now I can't believe my creep. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, anyway, the one that took out this satellite, well, caused, caused it to shut down, um, was 20,000 light years away. So that's enough to knock out one satellite. Um, just over ten years ago, one of them affected the ionosphere around the Earth. And that was 50,000 light years away. The nearest known one is 9,000 light years away. So it's approximately half the distance of that one. If it's half the distance of that one, then the energy will get to it will be four times that amount. Which is quite a lot. It might be interesting. And that's only the nearest known one. It's not necessarily the nearest one. So, the feet. What can we do about them? <laughs> Nothing that we won't know about them until they hit us. What's the risk? Well, there's a very high risk of satellite disruption. There's something that needs to be taken seriously. It is not the thing that is most risking our satellites. That's actually space weather. I'm not even touching on that in this talk because it's an entire half hour in itself minimum. Um, so a very high risk of satellite disruption, very small risk of human annihilation. So Armageddon risk, nah, not worth it. Let's move on. Cosmic rays. You've probably all seen this before. If you haven't, you will do. It's going to be on uh, few television programs as a result of what Tim Peake's been doing recently, I think. So what are they? They are high energy particles that originate from the destruction of massive stars, probably. Okay, hypernovae. Um, they can have enormous energies. The heaviest measured, well the most energetic measured one was called the oh my god particle <laughs> <laughs> Chris gives a talk about a god particle <laughs> this is the oh my god particle <laughs> this is it was probably a an iron nucleus and it had the same energy as a tennis ball whacked blooming hard by Andy Murray so this is one minuscule thing with the energy of something you know, which is pretty substantial going pretty fast um, it's nothing like that's ever been detected since. Um, but they themselves tend not to get through the atmosphere. What they do is they hit other atoms, molecules in the atmosphere, and disintegrate them. So you get this, this cascade. So one hits several match the chain reaction. So you get this shower of particles hitting the Earth. Um, they are around all the time. They can do things like they can cause DNA deletions. So they affect our chromosomes. We have evolved pretty well, you know, we, we deal pretty well with occasional things like that happening, just get rid of it. But it can cause instability to the human genome. If we were completely based in gamma rays, it certainly would. Um, they also cause errors in microchips. And I think I'll put the that is one flipped bit, one error per 256 megabytes of RAM per month, which might not sound a lot, that's just changing a 1 to a 0 or 0 to a 1. Okay. And now we've got quite a lot of, I don't know, I, you know I, had a, I had a 10 megabyte hard drive and I thought that was so good. <laughs> um, now, now uh, that's the Earth's surface. Up in space, up on the space station, they have to reboot the laptops almost daily because they're so much worse affected. So, how frequent are they? Well, they are constant. We're being hit by them all the time, even if you go underground. They're less there, fewer there, but it's still getting us. What can we do about them? We can live at low altitude because what? need to do 
you will never get anywhere in the universe that you can get away from them. But what you can do is limit their effect to what our bodies can need to deal with. And that is really what happens when you live at low altitude. <coughs> What's the risk? Well, it depends. Air crew, astronauts, you're in high risk. The one way of measuring electronic radio, uh, sorry, ionizing radiation is one is in millisieverts per year. And the safe limit is one millisievert per year. So that's what you get uh, 716 hour flights at 10,000 meters, 30,000 feet. Air crew are typically exposed to additional 2.2. So air crew get a heck of a lot more. They are more at risk of cancers. And that's just a statistical fact. And people who spend a lot of time on space stations and such like, you know, if people just spend years up there, very, very high risk. But let's forget about those because we can't. We can't do anything about those, apart from little born. So hypervelocity stars. Who's heard of hypervelocity stars? Mm. <coughs> okay. Mm. What you get is this. The theory is you get a, a triple star system moving close to a black hole. One of the stars falls into the black hole and the binary pair recoils as it's ejected and leaves the galaxy. Now one of the things discovered when they started looking at this objects called globular clusters which the thought to have formed at the same time as the Milky Way. So they're very, very old, which means the stars should be very, very old, which means they should be red. They found in them that there were actually quite a lot of blue stars. Blue stars are young hot stars. So how the heck do you get young stars forming in something that's incredibly old? And the idea is that they call them blue stragglers, so the idea was that they were sort of behind in their evolution. What actually happens is in those conditions, you get mergers of all the stars, and you get stuff, uh, the reactions that create hot blue stars start off again. Anyway, this blue straggler travels away from our galaxy. And about one and a half million kilometers an hour, which for something the mass of a star is pretty blooming fast. So if one came nearby, the, the chance of hitting, again, minuscule, remember, tiny target, okay? But if one came nearby, its gravitational effect could be enormous, depending on how, how close by it came. If it came very, very close, then it could perhaps just disrupt the planets in the orbit. But, but we have a really unusual star system, and it wouldn't take much more than the kick of a passing star to throw our planetary orbits into chaos again because they're not stable folks they may appear it on humans lifetime scales even longer than that they are and stayed enough long enough for us to evolve over you know, the last 450 million years or so but not stable over incredibly long periods <coughs> so that could happen. A little bit further away, it could disrupt what's known as the Oort cloud, which is this like a sphere approximately a light year in radius that surrounds the solar system and from where comets come. And comets thought to come from there when something gives them a kick, a gravitational kick. And if something came quite close, it would give quite a lot of gravitational kick. It might already have happened and we don't know about it because these things would be you know, still thousands of years away if they're traveling in. And so it's like you know, send debris down on us like many tons of bricks. How frequent are they? We know of 34 of them. And there's another five possible. Um, you'll be pleased to know they aren't any coming towards us. But we know of. <laughs> okay. The nearest one is 70 light years away, and even if it was coming towards us, um, it would take it, the time it will take is about 675 years per light year. 
So that's quite a lot of warning we get once we've detected one. In fact, our generation doesn't bother about it. You know, we have thousands of years. And let's think about what thousands of years mean. A thousand years ago, not much beyond the Battle of Hesse, it's not, not much further back than that. So, you know, a thousand years is a long time. Humans can do a lot in a thousand years. So what can we do about it? We're back to the original theme, nothing, but we'll at least be able to worry about them for a heck of a long time before they <laughs> <laughs> we'll Just think about all the people we have to get out their placards out saying the end is nigh. <laughs> <laughs> and for the first time, they'll be tried, they'll be right. <laughs> they'll smug some of them will be. But what's the risk? Probably minuscule. And it's back to this thing, we are a very, very tiny target. Okay. Rogue black holes. See, things are getting worse. <laughs> now it's a black hole. Similar sort of thing. So, basically, the result of a gravitational kick and merger of two black holes. The sort of thing that LIGO detected. Um, or detected last September, announced it last month, and then just detected another one gravitational waves from this sort of event. So they travel through intergalactic space at several million kilometers an hour. They'd be invisible to us because they are by definition black. They don't emit any radiation by which we can detect them. And they've consumed all the stuff around them so they don't have a highly energetic event horizon or anything like that. No, same thing, exactly the same thing as we get with high velocity, uh, hyper velocity stars. Massive disruption of the solar system if one came close. Um, if one got really close, yeah, that's spaghettification. <laughs> spaghettification <laughs> is fun <laughs> if you could survive it. I would love to be slim again. <laughs> <laughs> if you were going feet first into a black hole, the gravitational pull on your feet would be many, many times higher than the gravitational pull on your head. In other words, your feet, if you go your feet first, would accelerate into it faster than the other end of your body. Let's begin it. But not only that, one came close enough, one got within that region, the entire planet would be spaghettified, it would just become part of black hole singularity. What's a singularity? Um, Someone says we're God divided by zero. It's where laws of physics break down. Have any of your fellow astronomers had that happen to you? <laughs> um, not for being in a legal state of mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but again, you know, even if it only came close, and close in this would be you know, light within single figure light years away, the disruption to the Oort cloud could send enormous amounts of stuff back down on us. Uh, just after the Earth formed those what's called the late heavy bombardment, it could happen again. It's the sort of thing that caused that. That was um, about 200 million years of just enormous and consistent bombardment from stuff outside, which is really, really useful because this is something like that that is the reason that we actually have things like iron, carbon, all the metals, all the heavy metals, gold, in Earth's crust. Because before that, the modern Earth, when it differentiated into core, all the heavy stuff went to the core. So there's only the light stuff in, the, in what the, what's forming is the crust. And this lot coming in actually brought all the stuff that we use. So bombardments are useful, but not what we're trying to live. <laughs> so how frequent are they? You want to guess? Because when you didn't, because nobody knows. What can we do about them? Nothing. <laughs> the theme returns nothing. What's the risk? There's 16 zeros there. <laughs> so it's one in, I, I wrote it like that, so 10 to the 16, so just the, it looks bigger. Like that. Okay. Rogue planets. Why have we got small? You see. So, a rogue planet 
is a planet-sized body that has either been ejected from its planetary system, and in the, you know, the models of how our solar system formed suggest that there would have been other planets that would have been ejected, and some chucked into the sun, but some chucked out, or it might not never have been a, a, a solar system to start with. Yes, as um, interstellar gas clouds collapse, there might not be enough of them to be able to form something big enough to form a star, so you might just get, might just get planets forming. But therefore, these things are not, because they're not part of the system, they orbit the galaxy of their own volition, as it were. Which means they might not be going the same speed as us. Which means they might hit us. So how could they get us? Well, it's the same thing again. Collision with the Earth directly or disrupting the world cloud could set the cosmometry debris down, debris down upon us. How frequent are they? We haven't a clue, really. It's disputed. The low estimate we got up there is two for every star in the Milky Way galaxy, and that is 400,000 million, give or take 200,000 million. <laughs> the error bars are quite big. And the high estimate is 100,000 for every star in the galaxy. Now, it's, so the errors, again, the error bars are pretty blooming big. Okay? But here is one. The nearest one detected was this one. CFB DSIR 2149-0403. Isn't that an exciting name? And it's only 130 light years away. This was detected, well, it was announced in late September 2012. Now, does anyone, everyone remember what was going to happen on the 21st of December 2012? The Mayan calendar was coming to an end and because the calendar was going to cycle, the world was going to be destroyed and <coughs> people were then latching on to something that originated by a charlatan by the name of Zeph. Zachariah Sitchin, Zachariah Sitchin, of this planet Nibiru, planet X, which was going to hit us. Ah, they said, we were right. This is it. It's coming towards us. And look, 130 light years is close. <laughs> yeah, it is. But you can't travel 130 light years in two months. <laughs> or three months. And this will travel many times to speak light. But let's not let an understanding of science get in the way of a good conspiracy theory. <laughs> <laughs> you can sell, sell a few books, you know, this what it's about. So what can we do about them? <laughs> Nothing. Same theme, isn't it? What's the risk? It's not worth losing Not worth losing sleep over. Um, it comes back. You might wonder why I'm saying it's always the universe can kill us because they can. Um, but we're such a tiny target, we'd have to be incredibly unlucky. Right, here's a new one. Who knows what a Vern shot is? Vern shots, they come from Jules Verne. Remember how he got people to the moon? Blasted them there. And this is the idea of what a Vern shot is. So what you get, you get a massive buildup of gases under thick parts of the Earth's crust of cratons. And eventually, if you have enough of them, it can launch a huge block of crust into a suborbital trajectory. Suborbital just means it doesn't go into orbit, it just goes up and comes down somewhere else. That's not all. Think about what's going to happen if you suddenly excavate a socking great lump of Earth's crust all the way down to the Mohorovich discontinuity. Where all this stuff had been is now empty. Nature abhors a vacuum or even something of that sort of depth is going to be something just got nothing holding the, holding the rest of the crust out of the way. So everything else collapses in on it and you get this hypersonic shock waves that collapses in, pulverizes the remains of, of what's there with an explosion of to about 120 gigatons of TNT. 
So 20 billion tons of debris blasted into the atmosphere whilst lava sort of swells up and fills the hole that's left behind. This is rather nice, isn't it? <laughs> and then the impactor hits somewhere else. So we now got two bits of the planet nicely devastated. Well, where they'll get us is exactly like an incoming asteroid. So be much, much less warning. This would be minutes warning, not hours or days or weeks or months warning. But it's a much lower velocity. That's useful. If it's a low velocity, it means it's not going to cause so much damage. The mass is only a small part of the energy of something. The, um, the kinetic energy with which something hits is the mass multiplied by the square of the velocity. And something coming in from orbit around the sun with a closing speed of 20,000 kilometers an hour or faster uh, has got a heck of a lot of kinetic energy, as we will see. How frequent are they? Well, they may not ever have happened. There are some geologists who think they've happened. Geologists quite like this because it gets them away from having to listen to us guys about what might have caused disasters in the past. <coughs> okay. um, but, and they postulate that it happened every hundred million years or so. Um, there was even a theory going around while the Tunguska event was actually one of these, but you know, zero evidence of that. So what could we do about them? The return, nothing. What's the risk? Probably zero, so I think they probably don't exist. So I've really been wasting your time. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's look at something else. I will try to make amends. Galactic, galactic conditions. <laughs> they are exactly what it says on the tin. And there's some galactic collisions there. In fact, that's the result of a galactic collision there. Two or more galaxies collide and interact. And as the interstellar gases mix, you get massive star formation going on, which could be quite exciting. So how will they get us? So unless there is a direct interaction between our star and the star in the interacting galaxy, we could escape unscathed, completely unscathed. So we come back to this idea of the, the scale star density. In the spiral arms of a galaxy is about ping pong walls every 500 odd miles, and even in the core, where they're really, really densely packed, you look at any image of a galaxy and see how densely packed in they, they are, that is about a ping pong ball every three or four miles. So there's more space between the things than there is the things. It's like, um, probably some of us are of an age or disposition where we've either seen movies or played computer games where you're trying to navigate through asteroid fields and stuff like that. Get through the asteroid belt. Rubbish! The average separation of asteroids and asteroid belts are a million kilometres. This is like you know, sort of trying to get away from, get, you know, sort of navigate a pin through baked potatoes a kilometre apart. I mean, the <laughs> skill is not to find a space. The skill is actually, it's where the real skill is, is landing on one of the things. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, if there's, if we do get this direct interaction with the solar system, then yeah. All those things of gravitational interaction take place. But otherwise, it might not happen. How frequent are they? Well, there's another one. They're happening around us all the time. What can we do about them? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Ah, that was it. What's the risk? Probability 1, 100%. This will happen. There is no serious doubt that this will happen. Give it about four and a half billion years, <laughs> give or take half a billion years, this is going to happen. The uh, galaxy we call the Andromeda Galaxy is heading this way, or we're heading towards it. So, 
It's going to happen so we'll find out about this sooner or later. Next one. Asteroid strike. We've got through the first eight pretty blooming quickly. I'm going to spend a little bit longer on this. I'm afraid I'm going to get a little bit serious for it. So, lumps of rock, anything from a few kilometers, a few meters to a few kilometers, uh, causing a bit of damage. This, in 1800, is what the inner solar system looked like, if you drew a map of it. This is what it looks like in 1900. This is what it looked like in 1950. The green ones are all asteroids. The red ones, <laughs> if you can make the colours out, are ones which cross Earth's orbit. By 1990, the ones we knew mapped looked like this. Now this is a bit misleading because these dots are not to scale of the distance, okay? Um, if you did that, you would be able to see the dots. Or the screen would have to be miles wide. By 1999, we've got that. <laughs> and I'm not going to show you any more because it would just be a totally green screen. We know of loads of these things. Skip through that. So how will they get us? First one is impact. shatter stuff out, throw stuff, eject her up, melts the surface, that is depressed and fractures, you get hydrostatic rebound, then the central bit sort of becomes unstable, it's too steep and high, it collapses, you get this shattered stuff around. So that's the one. This is the other. Best animation I could find, sorry it wasn't English. Coming through the thermosphere here, it's up to about 80 kilometers. As a meteoroid. I'll go through the terminology again in a moment. Come through the mesosphere, and once it gets into the stratosphere, it can disintegrate, and once it comes down to the troposphere, you've got stuff that can land. And once that stuff lands, it can do damage but it's not necessarily the thing that is most damaging. So just to terminology, when it's in space doing nothing, it's a meteoroid or an asteroid. If we see the streak of light like a shooting star, that's a meteor. And if a bit lands, it's called a meteorite. Okay. So let's look at this. How frequent are they? A lot more than we thought, actually. So the Tunguska event, 1908, June the 17th, not a lot of people were affected because it happened in a fairly remote part of Siberia. But eyewitness accounts are quite interesting. People getting thrown into trees. You know, my uncle broke his arm when he fell out of the tree that he was thrown into and then something got hit twice and people were thrown out the radio, that was thrown out of their tents and all the rest of it. Artist impression, actual picture of the site. All the trees away from the blast were flattened out. The ones underneath it still stood upright. They just had their branches stripped off. <coughs> and this was the equivalent of about a 15 megaton blast from a thing that was probably about 100 meters in diameter. Not very big. The thing that hit Chelyabinsk, as I'm told by a Russian speaker I should pronounce it, in February a few years ago, was the size of a house, about 17 meters. That was 500 kiloton bars, so about 20 pounds. That was, that's a little 17 meter thing, um, is about 25 Hiroshima bombs worth of energy. Now the nice thing about that was that there were, that there's a lot of motor accident scams in Russia. So, the, 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 
higher proportion of Russian cars have dash cams compared to us. So there are lots of images of these. the sort of thing that 
It's smaller than that, which might help the dinosaurs. It's going to be up there. Worth thinking about. Its tsunami threat could be anywhere in there, depending on where it lands. So let's consider this. For a one kilometer impactor, expected approximately every 100,000 years, killing approximately 25% of the population, would cause approximately 15 million casualties in the UK. The cost per life, according to the EU, if I'm allowed to mention that, depending on where we are in our economic productivity, we are each worth anywhere between 825,000 and 3,100,000 pounds. So let's just take green cost halfway in between there. So that would be a total cost of 1.5 million pounds each, assuming we're in the middle somewhere. 15 million people is going to be a total cost of 22,500 million pounds. That's just the actorial cost of life that they work out in cost benefits in that analysis. So, cost per year, if we divide about 100,000 years, is about 225 million. Just, I shouldn't use the word just, just for the actuarial cost of human life. And that does not. This is the UK evidence. This figure does not include property, heritage, cultural losses, anything like that, more the human stuff we might care about. I hope you've allowed for inflation. <laughs> The entire United Kingdom Space Agency budget for 2015-16 is that. The entire budget is hardly enough. It, and basically, the reason we don't spend enough on this is because politicians think in terms of five years or so. Here we've got to be thinking long term into the future. Some people are. A lot of people like to make fun of Lembit. Leopard Opic. And Leopard Opic has done a darn good job of getting a committee together in Parliament which is now taking this sort of thing seriously. But whether it will ever actually happen, I don't know. Okay, let's show you a little movie. Of one way, and one thing that the Americans are working on, well, Americans and the ESA, Americans are leading it, but as you'll see, everybody's getting their voice in because everybody who's doing a little bit of this has to have their spokesman put in a bit into the publicity video. On February 15, 2013, the world saw the results of a small near-Earth object entering our atmosphere. The high-altitude explosion of 500 kilotons TNT energy Triggered by the impact of that 17 meter object, injured more than 1,500 people and caused extensive damage to Chelyabinsk, Russia. The necessary first step to defend the planet from the asteroid impact hazard is to discover those large near Earth objects that may pose a significant danger. The US and the European Union both have search programs. But what can we do if an asteroid is discovered that is about to hit the Earth? One mitigation approach is to deflect the asteroid, hitting it with a spacecraft and pushing it off its collision course. But this method has never been demonstrated. The Asteroid Impact and Deflection Assessment, or AIDA, is a joint venture of NASA and the European Space Agency to monitor, strike, and ultimately alter the orbit of Didymos a binary asteroid. AIDA consists of two independently launched spacecraft, an observatory and a kinetic impactor. The U.S. component, DART, is the kinetic impactor that will hit the asteroid in order to deflect it. ESA would build and launch AIM, the observatory, which will survey the targeted binary asteroid before and after the collision. Measuring the deflection precisely and determining key physical properties of the asteroid. Designed, built, and operated by the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, DART will be the first demonstration of kinetic impactor technology for asteroid mitigation. 
Darker wave impact is targeted about 6 kilometers per second relative to the asteroid, about 9 times faster than the bullet from an AK-47. The required targeting precision has been demonstrated by two intercept missions led by APO. First, the 1986 Vector Cell space-based interceptor of a thrusting vehicle. And second, the 2008 Burnt Frost sea-based missile interceptor of a satellite. And in 2001, NASA's near mission, led by APO's Andrew Chang, achieved another first, successfully landing on the asteroid Eris. We learned a great deal from NIR's mission to asteroid Eros. Now we want to learn how to deflect the nearest object using a spacecraft impact. When DART collides with a smaller, secondary member of Didymos, AIM will measure the change in its orbit, and that data will be crucial to prove we can change the trajectory of an asteroid on a collision course with Earth. AIM will measure very accurately the amount of the deflection but it will also characterize the surface properties of the asteroid and its interior structure. This information is required to characterize the physics behind the impact and to prepare for a possible future mitigation of an asteroid impact by a spacecraft kinetic impactor. And will demonstrate the payload and the spacecraft technology required to operate uh, nearby the asteroid and to observe the impact and characterize the impact dynamics of the accurate. Either is a unique international collaboration where the two separate missions each have independent value. In fact, should only one launch in time to land the asteroid Didymos, the science return will still be significant. For instance, if the is launched alone, the asteroid deflection can still be measured by observations of Earth. By operating together, AIM and DART will provide data that will answer a great deal of questions about everything from orbital and impact modeling <coughs> to theories about asteroid composition and material. The mission's two sections each will draw upon the respective strengths of the team designing and flying them and will provide invaluable data regarding asteroid deflection technology as a viable means of planetary defense. AIDA will leverage the respective strengths of the European and U.S. space agencies and space communities. Humanity needs to know how asteroids will react to deflection. AIDA will give us our first real answers to the question, what can we do if an asteroid is about to hit the Earth? <coughs> Boris and Nigel will say that the answer is to leave the solar system. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's, that's one way it could be done. There's lots of ways that have been postulated. You might have heard things like painting one side of it white or something like that. Or um, there's these B type things which you know, to go up there and they they can blast one side of the asteroid with lasers. Because again, we come back to this thing, it's only, we are a tiny target. You don't have to deflect something very much. And it misses completely. If you saw the Apollo 13 movie, well, it wasn't entirely accurate, but it was good enough. The asteroid, the um, asteroids had to get the angle of entry pretty much right. If they were a degree or so too shallow, they'd just bounce off the atmosphere. So, you know, we're dealing with things that are... That's something coming from any distance of the moon. If we detect something when it's much, much further than that away, the angular deflection is tiny. And we do actually have the technology to do it now. Although, you know, the dark thing, at least someone's taking something seriously, the kinetic impact of thing, we can do it now. Do you remember from the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, the ultimate capitalist weapon? I don't think it was, was characterized as the one it was a battlefield nuclear weapon that was designed to take out tank crews when the tanks rolled across Europe. Um, <coughs> the neutron bomb, which is now called an enhanced radiation device. Now the nice thing about that is if you get a good radiation blast, what you don't want to do is you don't want to destroy this body tank, because then it's just chaos. And what they're working on now as well. You deliver this thing in two goes. So you have one impact which creates a little crater and then you blast 
your enhanced radiation device, your ERD, quite close to that. And that just helps the effect of the thing. And you just deflect this thing maybe only a few arc minutes, and it's enough. And we know how to deliver stuff to asteroids. We don't. We've got this device. All we need is the technology joined up, and it, and it could be done in an emergency. This could be done if people were prepared to work on it. We have the capability of doing it. <laughs> so, after nine days, there is this chance, tiny, particularly if we add in the ways we invented doing it. <laughs> it's not. The universe is out to get us, and it will. Okay, it's got one dirty trick up the stick. That's, this is to scale. Sun now, sun as a red giant. <laughs> Diameter, two astronomical units. The definition of the astronomical unit is Earth's average distance from the sun. So if the sun was in the middle of, the, the, well, the sun was there, centered there, we'd be here on the edge. In other words, we'd be living on the edge of a star. That's that. <laughs> Why does this happen? Well, essentially, the way a star works, a star like our sun, is in the core, you've got very, very high temperatures, 15 million Kelvin or higher, and there you've got hydrogen being converted to helium. And then the energy takes millions of years to get to the surface, eventually it gets up. But what you've got essentially is you've got radiation pressure pushing outwards and gravity pushing inwards. So you've got this dynamic balance going on the whole time. When those reactions stop, gravity will start winning. Once that compression takes place, you can get a new set of nuclear reactions starting, but not just in the core, throughout the star, so the thing expands. Yeah. because we've got radiation pressure from everywhere now. And then it comes a red giant. So most people think it's going to happen in about 5.4 billion years when the sun becomes a red giant. It's not quite true. Because before the sun enters this phase, it's going to lose a heck of a lot of mass. So as a result of there the being less mass, that's all that's going to increase. Isn't that nice? So when it becomes a red giant, we won't be sat on the outside of the star because we'll be further away. <laughs> so we may escape, we will escape being got by the sun. So you think we're going to be safe then? <laughs> no. But there, if you think that, you have not been paying attention. The universe is out to get us, and it will, because about three and a half billion years before it ends that red giant phase, it's going to double in size over half a billion years. Its luminosity is going to increase, and the amount of energy it's pushing out is going to increase. So what that's going to do, the Earth will become hotter than Venus is today, the surface will become hot enough to melt the lead, the <laughs> oceans will boil away, they will disappear, the oxygen in the atmosphere will reach escape velocity probably, it will disappear, and bang. And what can we do about it? Nothing. What's the risk? Certainty, it's going to happen. We've got about two billion years, folks, and that's it. That's okay. How long has Homo sapiens been around? 100,000. Don't know if the earth can take another 2 billion. Right, so final score. Humanity, 9. Lucky. Universe, 1. That's brilliant. But we still lose. Whoops. What happened there? Oh dear. <laughs> Something went. It was a gamma ray for the gamma ray. That's where we ended up. We still lose. Because as I told you right at the beginning, even though we win 9 1, we still lose. Because as I said, the universe is an utter bastard. Thank you. <laughs>
That was uh, extremely entertaining, Steve. Thank you very much. So we've got some time for questions and uh, the usual uh, routine. The Simon's got the microphone and John is first with his hand up. So John, over to you. Hi. Um, I think you were saying um, towards the end that the number of asteroids seemed to be increasing rapidly. But you didn't explain why. It's not the number that is increasing. The number that we can detect is ah, increasing. Okay. So it's not that. Okay. No, there are there are more. I'm starting to get very worried. This. No, it is. Uh, no, it is. What the ability to detect them and the effort going into detecting them has increased a lot. Okay. Uh, a lot of this is actually triggered by. Um, anyone read Rendezvous with Rama? Arthur C. Clarke. It starts off with an, as an asteroid impact on northern Italy. And he talks about how this organization called Space Guard was formed as a result of it. And actually, now the, one of the European and um, British uh, efforts in this is called Space Guard. In fact, that chart I showed you, I got from Space Guard for their blessings. So, yeah. It's been four. And then Aaron. Yeah. Um, your configuration of these masses of material bursting out of the earth. I suppose one of the big risks is it blocked out the sun, so we all starve to death. Yep. And secondly, <coughs> is the Yellowstone National Park in this configuration? <laughs> You're talking about this um, hypothesized supervolcano. Yes, yes, yes they're um, not, I mean, they're no, really it, it, Yellowstone <laughs> grows at 5.5 centimeters a year at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's not the same as the burn shot thing because the, the crust isn't thick enough there and what would happen that would become a, more like a super volcano yeah I mean it would devastate North America but it's not the same thing you're not going to get stuff shoved up into you know, big lumps of stuff shoved up like that probably <laughs> I'm not a geologist I'm not really qualified to speak about geology uh, yes about corona mass ejections um, if things are going to be spreading up the earth, which I've never heard of, I have heard of the possibility of spreading out of the sun. Yes, um, that was one of the things, that's space weather, that I said I wasn't going to do too much on because it's a talk in itself. But just to give, put some perspective on that, um, these things do cause problems. There was a Qantas airliner where it was either cosmic rays or the result of a CME that set its, um, or its instrumentation wrong, and the air crew, the pilots suddenly thought they were in a 60 degree climb, so they in emergency kicked the thing down 60 degrees, so thought they were level and actually went into a 60 degree dive, and there were several people hospitalised as a result of that, after being pulled off the seat of the aircraft. Um, and the other one is, London 2012 was two weeks away from not happening, uh, CME went off the other way. If it had happened two weeks earlier, it was big enough to wipe out all our communication satellites. So yeah, um, space weather really is worth considering. I mean, it does, it does cause problems. It's caused um, national grid meltdown in Quebec already. So this is, and the current event in 1859 is when they first got interested in this sort of thing. This was just when Telegraph was getting going. A big CME came this way. And what happened was um, the nice wooden telegraph boxes that people were using with attack or receivers and or it's not sort of bursting into flames and operators got shocks and and they didn't immediately know what it was but it's worth looking up Carrington event it's so well known one yep um, John and then the what are the chances that humanity might survive for just let's say the, the next hundred years <laughs> I'm not a sociologist. How about ten? I'm not even going to try to appear to be able to answer that. How many are since the the rogue planets is is still that? How are they detected? How what's the detection like stuff like? Optically, I mean the the ability to detect stuff now is so much greater than it was even 20 years ago. So now, for example, amateurs, um, like myself, if I had the skill, would be able to take images that large ground-based telescopes could only dream of 
um, even 20, 30 years ago. It, the the, the rates of techn technological change happened so quickly in this regard. So now they can detect very, very faint things. So is it definition is in a rogue planet? And the northern planet is obviously being rotating or something, yeah? So yeah. To, how do you know if it's in a rogue planet and there's a big bloody rock? Okay, the, the, defi the def proper definition of planet is it is, um, you know, the solar system planet, is it something that orbits the sun and it's got enough mass to put itself spherical, it clears its orbit about the subsequent gravity. This is just basically the idea that a similar sized lump of rock, Sorry. it would at least be enough to um, pull itself spherical, have enough mass to pull itself spherical. Yeah. Any more? Yes? Thank you for the great talk, Steve. Uh, fascinated by the burnt shot uh, theory. Uh, I'm just wondering if um, that happens to these parts of the uh, crust that are very old and yeah. very hard. I understand to be several kilometers deep. Yeah. Uh, if, if that's the case, if, if carbon dioxide were capable of resisting a pressure that you get several kilometers of rock, then presumably you wouldn't be able to keep carbon dioxide in things like our extinctions. Is that, is that really a, a feasible idea that carbon dioxide will, will blow down that well, rock into space? Well, it's, it's a heated carbon dioxide and other gases and, and, and. Um, I have to say I don't know a lot about burn shots and I thought it would be an interesting one to put into the talk because geologists like that. But, uh, so, no, I, Fred, I can't give you the absolute on exactly how feasible a burn shot is. Personally, I don't think they're that feasible, but just because I'm not a geologist, I'm not going to say they were talk rubbish. <laughs> Apologies to any geologist. Any more? No? Okay. Well, I think they're all uh, suitably amazed and uh, worried. I think they're all going to lose sleep tonight. And, uh, the, the one that is going to definitely get us. The only thing we can do is drink whiskey. The only thing we can do is drink whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, could I end by wishing you a really safe journey? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>